So just to start, of course, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm sure most of us have sort of met each other, know each other, um, have met at some point. I just wanted to start off first of all by saying welcome. Um, my name is Brandon Sullivan and I am part of this very fantastic group of people who have put together this first of hopefully very many sessions that we'll be doing um, pertaining to digital human rights in the Caribbean. This uh, first two or the first two sessions, this being the first of them, um, would be pertaining um, mostly to the more um, fundamental aspects of human rights, especially digital human rights in the Caribbean. Um, I will uh, just ask anyone who is here just to go through, um, you know, as you so please, and, you know, of course, introduce yourself, um, where you sit, from what organization you sit, and um, yeah, and of course, I, I should actually say I'm with Wikimedia of the Caribbean. Um, of course, we have other people who are also affiliated with Wikimedia of the Caribbean and other initiatives as well. So take it away, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say, Sherry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, I am Sherry Antoine. I am a lead organizer of Wiki Caribbean and the executive director of AfroCrowd. Um, Wiki Carry, as uh, uh, Brandon is also uh, a part of our leadership, um, is a great new initiative that you should be a part of if you care about the Caribbean and Wikipedia. Um, just to say, uh, you know, very politely <laughs> and um, uh, no bias at all. Um, because it's focusing not only on the, the, the great culture and people and food and, and history and notable events and so forth of the Caribbean, which um, uh, can often be missing from uh, the pages of, of Wikipedia, um, but also it's a great group to um, connect with if you wanna learn how to um, be involved in Wikipedia um, as an editor, as is AfroCrowd. So AfroCrowd focuses on the African diaspora, um, although anyone from any background can be involved. Um, and Wiki Caribbean focuses on the Caribbean and its diaspora. And so um, in Wiki Caribbean, we have a great event coming up next week. It's going to be um, our second annual Wiki Cari Festival, and it's Sunday um, from next Sunday, excuse me, from uh, 2.30 to 5 p.m., if I can make a, a slight plug. And also, um, we want to continue and we look forward to continuing being involved in um, not only uh, uh, talking about Wikipedia as in terms of human rights, uh, digital human rights in the Caribbean, but also in um, terms of um, uh, helping others to learn how to edit Wikipedia um, in general, but also definitely in terms of the Caribbean. So today's going to be a great day, and I'm so glad that we're able to join Access Now today, and all of you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sherry. And of course, I want to open the floor to have our other distinguished guests, Angela, Soledad, Gaspar. Um, please go ahead in any order you feel comfortable with. Please introduce yourselves, where you sit, and uh, of course, you know the work that we've um, been doing over the past couple of months, years, and you know we look forward to in this event as well. Thanks, Brandon. Super happy to be here too. My name is Angela Larcon. I'm the campaigner for Latin America and the Caribbean at Access Now. Access Now is an organization that defends the, the human rights in the digital age for every user and person in risk. Uh, there are a lot of spaces that we try to cover. <laughs> um, from digital ID to um, digital security, how to protect personal data, um, what's going on with, sur with surveillance through the region and so on. Um, and we are, I particularly am super happy and excited about this editaton because I feel that the Caribbean needs to show more about itself. Like it's a lot happening and maybe people not they don't really know how to access to this information or they don't even know this information 
and these news are 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 out there. So that's uh, on my side. Um, and also for access now, we have in here Gaspar Pisanu, who is the policy leader for for the region. So I don't know if you want to say a couple of words, Gaspar. Yes, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for this invitation, this opportunity. I share the words that Angela just said about how important it is for the Caribbean to keep moving forwards um, through this path of knowledge uh, regarding human rights in this new era. Um, as she mentioned, I'm the Latin policy manager. Um, and well, I work, we, we work on different areas. I'm more specialized in the analysis of laws. And um, Angela is our strategic leader. So yeah, we are really happy to be involved in this initiative. Excellent. Soledad, please. Hey, everyone. Hello from Montevideo, Uruguay, the southwest capital city in South America. Um, I am a sociologist. I've been working in the intersections between education, digital technologies, and human rights for the last 10 years. I started with Plan Ceibal, which is a government program from Uruguay that delivered computer, personal computers to all students and teachers from the public system and connected all schools. Um, and I I worked at Plan Ceibal as a researcher, trying to figure out which were the impacts of technology for social development, for education. This was before smartphones. So we really needed to argue why we were investing in computers and the internet uh, instead of other, of course, um, very important issues that are still um, affecting our population. Um, with a lot of questions, I then went to study abroad. Um, and I realized that, for example, in Europe, in Europe, the discussion was more around human rights, the right to privacy, acknowledging that one in three individuals online globally are under the age of 18, and how internet uh, governance discussions were not engaging with the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, and also how could we implement solutions that could, um, um, that could recognize more integrally that convention balancing protecting children while uh, enabling their participation. So how would we can engage them in, in, the, in the digital policy discussion? So since uh, the end of 2020, I've been navigating, uh, um, trying to bring solutions to that through a gap in critical digital education, not only teaching with digital technologies, but also about how this work, how these are connected to um, human rights and collaborating, creating these solutions in collaboration with educators, and youth from Latin America, these projects are all from Latin American scope. The resources and reflections are shared openly in order to advocate for this to be formally adopted. And I'm particularly interested, of course, uh, in Latin America and in the Caribbean, we are the most unequal region in the world and digital technologies are cause and consequences of these inequalities, um, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, in terms of children's rights, there's uh, a lot of things going on and how all these fast digital solutions are impacting their lives and, and how um, we, can, we, can, we can bring together more inclusive solutions. Thank you for that, Soledad. No, that's, I mean, that's a perfect segue actually uh, into you know, what we wanna um, tuck into for the first half of the discussion. Um, you know, one thing that comes to mind when you were talking just now, Soledad, is, you know, the way in which, you know, Latin America and also because we're focusing here, for instance, on the Caribbean, um, you know, we have seen so many different renditions of human rights and that sort of eventual march towards, um, you know, bettering and or, you know, perfecting our efforts towards human rights in many ways. Of course, we won't get into all of them, but, you know, one thing that, and one question that stuck out to me was, you know, how do different stakeholders, you know, be it government, you know, uh, civil society, the public sector, how do different stakeholders really envision, you know, um, the various challenges as to digital human rights? This isn't just a question that's just, you know, something that's restrained or constrained to that of the Caribbean, but this is a question that really bedevils all of, um, you know, policy across the world um, in the policy sphere, as it were. Um, and, you know, if I could, you know, if we really go back to the 
sorry, go ahead. I think um, if if my co-hosts can um, also man the 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 room as well, please uh, go ahead. Um, you know the the broad sort of um, journey into digital human rights really starts from the very base of human rights. And of course, we oftentimes think of human rights without necessarily understanding too deeply what the context surrounds. And human rights, of course, is more so a, an aspirational, um, according to some scholars, but a broad and very um, all-encompassing view of um, so about that. Realize we speak <laughs> uh, broad, uh, you know, sort of an interpretation of that which all humans should be availed. You know, so we oftentimes think about the right to, you know, association, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, all these various things. Um, you know, when we come into the conversation about um, human rights, um, while pertinent have in some way shaped the conversation of which we have now as it pertains to that of digital human rights. <coughs> well, what's most uh, you know, interesting about the entire conversation is the fact that very often we don't regard these things as being related. In fact, we often think of them in ideological silos. Um, as we treat with and we see now, especially in the Caribbean, the um, onset and the continuing development of certain digital ID laws, for instance, oftentimes do not take into consideration a deference for an understanding a more novel comprehension of um, human rights and how we can interpret that within the digital sphere. And that perhaps also ties into why, for instance, there is such a glaring lack of information, chiefly as it pertains to What's happening in the Caribbean as it relates to digital human rights, but just what's happening in the Caribbean in general. We're not seeing very much coverage of that happening on Wikipedia and other online forums and, you know, other, um, especially because Wikipedia is such, uh, or is the most foremost um, forum for um, knowledge on the internet. And I wanted to put this question to anyone on the floor, any of our participants, you know, what do you envision as one of, or you could, you know, mention several, but what do you envision as one of the foremost or one of the most manifest challenges um, to digital human rights right now, especially as what's happening in the Caribbean, but also feel, feel free to, to share from your perspective as well. Um, I'll say, <laughs> I'll say that actually, oh, sorry, Gaspar, <laughs> um, I jumped the line. Uh, I'll say that actually just like combining people, like getting people to join and I believe even this event is uh, a way to, to an example of it. Like we are eager to, more things happening in in the Caribbean, like looking at because regarding digital rights, or um, there is a lot happening. But I believe that maybe the organizations are just too too busy with all the other very relevant um, issues regarding with human rights, with, regarding with politics, the context of every country, and so it is sometimes kind of difficult to try to convey both things like try to get the attention to also these kind of issues which also are going to affect the citizenship in years to come like for example digital id um bills regarding digital ID could seem not as harmful as other things that are happening in the current context but they are going to have impact in generations to come. So for me, I believe that's one of the uh, of the biggest challenges right now. Gaspar, please. <laughs> yes, um, kind of in the same line as what Angela was saying. Um, there is a lack of awareness that we all have to live with in the whole region in all America, right? Um, that's something that we are still struggling, that we are finding new ways to get the general public to understand why this is relevant. 
because despite the fact that there are big issues in in most of our countries like poverty uh, people without connectivity um, safety issues we are talking here about technological advancements that are used to control the population which is something that if we read in some sort of book or in some other place in the world will be complete, completely worried about what's going on. But it's something that if you're not aware, you cannot um, establish a really good dimension of what the harm could be. But what worries the, uh, me the most, uh, particularly when we talk about the Caribbean, is that this lack of awareness is not only in the general public, but also in other organizations, in the tech community, in governments, in academia. I think there is a lot of work to do in engaging with these new, um, with these uh, sectors in these new uh, topics, right? Um, I will then speak about how digital rights are no other thing than human rights. And understanding that fact, I think it's crucial. And some sectors, it, it would be great if we can engage with other sectors that could enforce this, uh, the importance of these uh, topics. Agreed, agreed, Gaspar. Um, you know, and I really love the fact that, you know, both you and Angela, you know, you really touched on such a important point, you know, the salience of digital human rights is veritably lost on a lot of us in the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, to be honest, you know, when you have a look at civil society writ large across the Caribbean, we really are, especially as pertains to if I could extend this to just the general state of Caribbean democracies right now, really in a very tough spot right now. And, and what's going on as it relates to the current struggle with COVID-19 and you know, deepening inequality, it really raises a number of questions as to how civil society organizations, especially those that which are assembled here, how do we then treat with also, you know, moving forward with the kind of um, you know, efforts at increasing the, that information salience, making people aware, but also you know, making it as digestible as possible so that people can sort of internalize you know, that messaging and also treat with you know, going about with, say, vandalizing to other people saying, hey, look, are you, are you feeling, are you understanding what's going on with it relates to how your data is being ma managed, you know, how are you, are you, you know, keeping up with the recent changing that's been going on as to certain laws, certain ID laws, how will that affect you? You know, there was a recent um, circular that was passed on actually by a colleague of us, of, of ours, um, Yassin, um, out of the Dominican Republic, who, you know, um, shared some, some insights of what's going on in Jamaica. Um, and of course, that only speaks to just one very small part of the conversation that's been going on across the region, across the world, as to how people really are fundamentally disengaged from understanding not just how these laws may impact them, but also what the power of knowledge and what the power of knowledge really has um, in terms of moving forward and turning the tide. Again, not just through knowing, but also through populating that record, such like on Wikipedia and other platforms, how we engage with that, we have to change the way in which we engage with that. So Lidad, I want to recognize you so you have your hand raised. Go ahead, please. I also wanted to compliment uh, to what Angela and, and uh, Gaspar were talking about uh, in terms also of access to the internet, particularly when we're talking about islands and um, and we never, I think that within the Caribbean, maybe sometimes Cuba uh, gets the this, this spotlight too often. We don't really get to know about uh, the wide diversity of, of countries that also uh, entail the, the Caribbean. And also reflecting on, we, we talk about Latin America and the Caribbean. Why cannot we talk about Latin America in general? What are we dividing regions? Who is getting benefited from this division um, as well? But emphasizing the importance of internet access and 
which groups, which specific brackets are being impacted by these digital uh, divides, mostly women, Afro communities, indigenous communities in, in the region, which, which are already um, um, often excluded from, from society. Just wanted to add that point. Absolutely, the, the issue of connectivity, just overall access, you know, comes up over and over, especially in the conversation um, as it relates to, you know, the Caribbean, of course, in wider Latin America, even right now, um, a few countries in the Caribbean, even whilst they might have abnormally high um, cell phone penetration rates, the actual rate of connection or the actual ability for people to connect to the internet is still not as high as we'd like it to be. I think at last count, I think, you know, it's somewhere in the region of about 45 to 50% of um, the population across the Caribbean that has access to, and again, this is excluding, you know, certain geographies like Cuba, um, which sits in its own special distinction. Um, there's certain, uh, you know, most people in the Caribbean still do not have the kinds of access, or at least the kinds of access that is broadly defined through international apparatus. They do not have the kind of access that would even allow them to even begin to start the conversation about what it would look like to have their digital personas constrained by new and novel laws being you know, contrived by government. Um, another question that I wanted to ask is, you know, and another point that I'm seeing sort of being um, the, the needle being thread here is that of, you know, how overall knowledge and knowledge competence, knowledge led economies. Um, oftentimes, when we think about that, we often th times think about it in a sense of, you know, industry, how do we drive, you know, industrial efficiency, especially if you're taking it from sort of like an economic standpoint. But one thing that often comes to mind, too, is the fact that you know, information-led democracies, however ideal we'd like to think of that as being, um, information-led democracies oftentimes are able to treat with certain um, movements and certain understandings of things such as what we're discussing um, with a um, bit more nuance. Um, we recognize, for instance, in certain contexts that, again, there's a distancing. Um, the conversations are siloed and oftentimes it's just seen as another bill. Who cares about identification? It doesn't affect me, I already have identification. But the broader question is more so about the fact that if I knew what this law sort of presaged in terms of my digital footprint, um, the way in which, again, there are myriad examples around the world as to how digital footprints actually tie into manifest implications for your person and human security, which is also something I, I study in real life. Um, you know, there are manifest implications for that and the digital is practically the real. So how do we then again sort of compress and disseminate as efficiently as possible that kind of information as that we need to, you know, as civil society, do we need to find a way to sort of work around those um, sort of more finer points? Um, is it that there are other points of consideration that we're perhaps not taking into account? You know, what do we think is really missing from that engagement? And, I, I want to be cognizant too of the fact that, you know, um, if, if you have a point, you know, if you're not a panelist and you have a point that you want to raise as well, please use your raise hand function and you could also chime in just as well. But again, you know, the question is open. What, what do you um, see as being a likely, um, you know, deterrent or, or headwind as it relates to how we engage with the knowledge of these current events going on? Gaspar, yeah, I think there are a lot of things to do in order to get that engagement. I think one key factor is to something that I insist a lot um, for South America, but I think the Caribbean is, uh, is in a very particular situation. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, Sometimes all the attention is uh, put on Cuba and not in the rest of the countries. And it, I think it has a lot to do 
with the international um, attention the Korean is receiving. I know that for last events or so, the, the Caribbean start to gradually be more in the agenda. But it's clear that that's not enough. Uh, at some point is that international demand that organization, organizations like ours had to work on that will get the Caribbean to pay more attention into these facts. Because that that's like the first piece of a chain of making other organizations, public institutions, and private sector to found initiatives in the in the Caribbean. That means civil society, uh, other organizations that advocate for a better connectivity and stuff like that. I think the the main issue right now is that the, all the focus when we are talking about the global south, a term that is a lot uh, very discussed even internally in 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 our organization and even in my mind um, is that apparently when we are talking about global south, the only thing that matters is those places where there are big markets. And I'm specifically talking about Africa. Africa right now uh, has a very important, important focus because there are um, estimates that in the near future, their economy is going to be as big as the ones that we know today um, that are the biggest, right? Uh, it's focused on Brazil, it's focused on, on, on India. And I think that in those places where the market is not relevant, no one pays attention. So we need to escape that logic, bring these voices to international events, to international bodies, and make them understand that this is something that we should be paying attention despite how many people is there how big their countries are, how relevant are for the companies set in the US. I think that's one of the key um, elements to unlock this process. Because it's a process that we've seen in other places, you know, as the digital world uh, kept advancing. I think that's like a, a first stage. And then start getting, um, as, I, as we mentioned before, uh, other um, sectors attention, especially I think there is a huge um, demand for media coverage on these issues. Um, there is a, an educational work also to do with these people. Those are the ones that will let uh, more people to engage, to create more organizations. And that, that is like, a sort of steps that we should follow in order to um, build this knowledge in the in the region. Thank you for that, Gaspar. Um, yeah, and I completely agree. Yeah. There's um, it, it, a lot of the focus really does seem to be um, intentioned on some sort of nascent market. Um, and I will say too that, you know, this is also a question that oftentimes comes up even in say a lot of activations for instance in, in Africa for instance like you know there's a lot of questions sometimes about how for instance organizations like you know big tech for instance oftentimes engages um, in a way that doesn't exactly feel all that genuine especially because a lot of the time like for instance, what we see happening in, in regard to say, I mean, I don't want to finger point one particular company, but the, the, the situation that happened in Nigeria, for instance, with, um, with Twitter, for instance, thankfully there was a lot of pushback as it relates to what had happened and the curtailment of um, the usage of um, Twitter on, on, you know, in Nigeria and how, for instance, the government had sort of created this broad prohibition and, you know, it's, it's I think it's still going through the courts right now, but Again, I think that was one very recent, but also very potent example of how, for instance, that even that instance in and of itself really had manifest implications for people. Because again, this came from and stemmed from um, on the ground activation of people speaking out on, you know, the abrogation really of their human rights, their ability to assemble and also just their ability to just live, you know, and, and, and to live and live with dignity. 
Um, and Hela, I also want to raise your hand. I want to um, acknowledge you. You have your raised hand, so please go ahead. Um, let, me, let me stop talking. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. No, just a little comment because I, I'll, I know that we have more in the agenda. But for me, this question is interesting because um, as a campaigner, like my, my, I always have some sort of um, pushback. I personally thinking on create campaigns of awareness because it is too general. So it, it and it's like, who's the audience? Like general population, and it is so broad that it eventually make kind of make no sense. But in the line of what Gaspar was saying on the education, I believe that even some terms that are related with digital rights or with rights in the, in the digital age, they may seem like they are too um, away from our understanding. And there's, that's, not, that's not the real. I mean, it is, it is with a, a little bit of explanations, with a little bit of information, they are accessible for everyone. But I believe that, um, working with grassroots and I don't know maybe doing workshops like just trying to make these subjects more close to the people is like the very necessary first step to then later on um, talk about I don't know like create recommendations to try to avoid certain bill to pass or like bigger projects but the very first step I believe is just to work with the grassroots and try to grasp these concepts and how do they mean and how do they impact me? Completely agree with you, dear Angela. Um, I really believe that there is a lot to be said about how, for instance, we get to the practicalization, if you will, of some of the terminologies that we have. And I say that knowing that that's also a very nebulous term in and of itself. Um, but yeah, no, there, there, really, there really is just, um, you know, a lot to be said as it pertains to that. Um, I also, Sherry, if I'm not mistaken, I think you, you had your hand raised, or you indicated that you wanted to touch on that really quick. Um, you were just reading my mind, that's all. I didn't <laughs> mention anything. <laughs> 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 But um, yeah, no, I, I was just agreeing with uh, everyone who is talking, um, and especially uh, with Angela, who just uh, mentioned, um, you know, uh, training and so forth, which is something obviously that um, when we we do uh, trainings, we've done them all over um, the place and um, in different languages uh, um, on Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia... Um, and we'll, we're going to talk about it some more, so I won't uh, <laughs> hog that time there. But I do want to mention that, you know, a lot of times when people approach um, technology, um, there is still an intimidation factor. And um, one thing that um, uh, Wiki, uh, projects within the Wikimedia movement, for example, um, to do simple trainings on how to edit Wikipedia can be a doorway to continuing education um, about uh, and digital digital awareness in general, and what I mean by that is is once the aura you know is gone, you know, and um, uh, participants see that they can be part of uh, you know the writing of their narrative in digital space, um, even to the point of um, um, some basic coding that you can do on Wikipedia and having someone kind of guide you through that, I think is a nice gateway that's one of the most available and open platforms that's possible online um, where people are needed, especially people with um, who speak mo more than one language, for example, um, I think is a great way uh, to step into that space. Even if it's only for that time, it takes away some of the moss um, 
around um, technology and um, re-enlightens people that you can be a part of the technology that's so affecting your life. And all of these, um, uh, the, the changes that are happening that can sometimes feel enormous, especially for those who are not necessarily born into a technological space. So um, to have yourself kind of see that, um, you know, this is just another thing to learn. This is just another, step to take rather than something um, unimpassable, I think can be um, uh, pretty empowering to um, anyone who who uh, wants to understand that more or um, does feel that kind of intimidation factor. So knowledge, as they say, is power. Completely agree. It's perhaps the most greatest power there is. If, you know, I mean, you can only really do what you know um and it's it's again a testament to where we are right now and the fact that we have yet still a enormous amount to climb but of course with the corpus of people that are working on the virus initiatives be it say you know on Wikipedia, on social activism on digital activism i mean there is so much um, ahead of us, and there's so much work that I'm so excited to see being accomplished in the region. Um, so what I'll do now is uh, we're moving on to the next section of our um, a sort of program here. So I want to, you know, turn a lens on to, you know, the more fundamental ideals of human rights, especially those constituent parts that make up the conversation of digital human rights. Um, I am going to acknowledge, I think here I'm going to acknowledge Kaspar actually. Uh, I think you touched on this, um, you know, a, a bit in your, in your um, earlier um, discussion, but, you know, if you will, you know, please, um, you know, just go ahead and of course we will have a more open discussion on um, your points there. And then, um, yeah, so go ahead, please, Gaspar, you have the floor. Thank you, Brandon. Yes, you said, I think uh, a very crucial point of um, what I wanted to discuss uh, has already been said. And it's basically that digital rights are human rights as we already know them. In fact, there are some, if, if you get into a more academic discussion, some people say that talking about digital rights is wrong because there's not such a thing. There are human rights in the digital area, era, as we, as we, is our motto in, in Access Now. And despite that, I think it's, it's interesting to, to have a particular name because it's like quite a new phenomenon. Right, but in general, as I said, are, are the same rights. Uh, the difference is that we have different interpretations and applications for those rights. So these uh, human rights have adapted, have changed, um, and in some cases they gave birth to some new rights because of that adaptation, let's say, of because basically how any right is created because our society evolved. Um, when we are talking about traditional rights, like for example, privacy, um, it's very interesting how the digital world affected the concept of privacy. Historically, we always talk about um, a right for reclusion. Reclusion means the possibility of, for someone to um, be let alone. And when the informational era came, and even before internet, then we start seeing like a positive aspect because when we're talking about reclusion, we talk about the negative aspect of privacy. But there's also a positive aspect of what privacy means. That is the ability of someone on deciding what sort of information or what sort of things I want people to know about me, right? That's control over your own image in regards to third parties, let's say. 
That's when this, the autodetermination right was born. And now we talk a lot more about autodetermination than um, sometimes privacy, even privacy. Maybe this, this right is the one that presents the more most challenge in, in terms of the, the digital era, because you have the big data, both in the public and in the private sector, you have surveillance systems, both as well in the private and in the public sector. We have internet that redefine the concept of what is private, right? Um, and in fact, we used to say that data protection was uh, uh, um, like came from the right to privacy. Right now, data protection is like more transversal, let's say it touches a lot more rights than just privacy. And in fact, is more linked to the self-determination that uh, with, than with privacy, or, or let's say with the positive aspect of privacy. Um, same thing for freedom of expression. I like the example of freedom of expression because I think it's the, the one that um, gives us an idea of what means that these, these rights are the same as uh, we all seen. It seems like fake news, misinformation, and propaganda are like new phenomena. And I think the, the, the beginnings of these uh, issues came from ancient Greece. The thing that changed now is that we have a new channel, a massive channel of communication. And not just that, we have a channel where information has been democratized, democratized sorry. Because you don't have now like a few big companies managing the information that people can obtain, which was usually news media outlets that we know that in the past we have three to four in each country that could change people, people's opinion. Now someone simply with a blog uh, can be considered a journalist or can be informing people. And that's what... Uh, also produced the, the era of information also produced the era of this misinformation because we have way too much information we have way too much uncertainty and people need to have certainty in their lives and that is why these um, conspiracy theories or um, propaganda are more effective now because people are so uncertain that need these kind of theories that explain the reality uh, very in, in very simple terms, right? So we see that the phenomena that affect freedom of expression is not that they exist now, but they've always existed now that they are bigger and they have massified. Um, of course, there are new challenges because as I said, now you have more people creating content. We've seen that there are regulations for traditional media outlets, but when it comes to someone just writing, it's like, I don't know, should we have a, even a regulation? That's the bigger discussion, right? But there are also other, other rights, like the right to not to be discriminated. Something that we talk a lot when um, some new type of artificial intelligence is being developed because we see a lot of um, automated decision making. Uh, and with that, we've seen how these uh, systems tend to be flawed and not to recognize the things that uh, a person doing the same task could identify and creates a lot of um, issues in terms of labor, in terms of credits, in terms of um, many other aspects. Also, uh, we see the, the freedom of, of reunion um, affected by, by this new era where you see that when we used to get into the public square to discuss political issues, now that square have moved as well to a digital space. Um, 
some consider social media to be that new square where you can express yourself and where the, the political discussion occurs right now. Um, but we also need to be aware of some new rights, as I said, um, as the data protection rights and a lot of rights that come with this uh, new, new right. Um, also, a very discussed um, right that is the, the right to access to internet, um, which is something that some might not consider is a human right, but if you start seeing what uh, are the implications of not having access to the internet, when we are talking about the more, most extreme cases like shutdowns, you see that is one of the most used tools from um, authoritarian governments to silence people and to disorganize them, let's say, or trying to diffuse what's bringing people to the streets. But at the same time, if you're talking in normal times, you see that people that uh, cannot have access to the internet have huge disadvantages in terms of um, education, in terms of labor, in terms of political rights, and many other rights. So if you can not consider it a, a human right, if you want, but it's definitely an enabler for every other human right. So the relevance or, or the name you want to give it is not, uh, it's just a, a semantic issue, but we have to acknowledge the importance of this. And also, uh, I think it's it's quite funny, all the discussions that are right now because of the pandemic and how a lot of people move to the to a digital space, their their usual lives or mainly their, their work lives. You have now a right to be disconnected now because apparently we are all working all the time in our offices right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure that many here feel identified with that statement. And so we have to come up with this new idea of not being all the time connected and, and having these spaces we have. So the, the digital world has integrated so much, to, so much to the physical world that right now we had to create a right to keep them apart, right? So I think that is a very interesting um, idea of what this era uh, represents. Um, as well as other labor rights, like the people that works in these delivery apps uh, and how these new um, power struggles are created. So we need to start to uh, tweaking the laws and the things that we already have in order to adjust to this new reality. And one final reflection I always have when I talk about this is because it's the question that I get more asked um, when in, let's have, let's say we have a, an introductory course about digital rights is, okay, do we need to regulate? And I would say most of the time, I think that the answer is no. I think we already have a lot uh, of, of laws that can be applied both locally, like our constitution and the deputation of the judges, both in Commonwealth system and in Roman law systems. I think we have international treaties, we have statements from international bodies, we have a lot of material in order to apply these rights. But in some cases, regulation is crucial. And the best example I can think, I can think of is data protection laws. Like we've seen privacy right being regulated across time in our constitution specifically as in some cases avias data and people being able to access that information having, and trying to have control. But this dis disruptive new technology came and now people find um, harder to, to control that data. So we need new tools in order to protect users. Um, I think the key point for understanding digital uh, rights is adapting and trying to make the best interpretation of the spirit of the law for past cases. I think that's where the real challenge is, understanding what we wanted to achieve 
when we for 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 the first time someone think about privacy as a right what do we want to um how do we want to keep applying those values that are behind the rights that we already know uh that's the key point because otherwise and we see a lot of this when we are talking about intermediary liability regulations is that you start seeing that here the discussion is not really about allowing people to express themselves, but instead creating some sort of tool to control what is what it doesn't seem to be controllable. You know, when you start analyzing why these regulations come up like this in, in, in our countries, you see that behind it, that the threat is not only coming from the technology, but also from the people that is trying to control the technology. Um, well, I think I, I've already said enough, so I think it's better if we can discuss about this. No, I mean, absolutely, Gaspar. I mean, you touched on a, a wealth of super pertinent points. I Several of them jumped out at me, actually. And I think the one that really rested with me, you said just now, you know, being that a lot of the recent efforts um, by a few government, um, you know, stakeholders, um, seem to be less interested in offering a sort of um, fundament upon which, you know, we can protect um, certain modes of expression, but rather it becoming more so an extension of state control in many sense. Um, and it's deeply unfortunate that that's the reality that we're in. But of course, if we're taking into consideration a lot of the conversation that happens oftentimes as it pertains to it being an extension of say state security and national security, this also becomes a question of human security, which in and of itself is a very novel concept and something that, you know, um, people within law, international relations, everyone's still grappling with the concept and really trying to morph out a, a, a way to sort of um, deal with and to define that. Um, I think another thing that really comes to mind to me too is for instance how and this is something you also touched on um the idea of misinformation and disinformation and how you know the channels that we have now are manifold they um possess many different forms they come in many different realities and oftentimes are um misinformation in particular but especially disinformation um they're insidious you can't see them we don't know, we don't oftentimes uh, recognize it, but the only time we actually can find or recognize it is when the damage has already been done. And one of the, um, of course, one of the chief ways in which um, I, for instance, um, have been looking to, at least in, in the way, or at least the seat that I sit in, um, to help tide or change the course and direction of where especially the Caribbean is going is to, of course, be much more um, hands on as it relates to the information ecosystem in the Caribbean. Um, of course, you know, being with Wikimedia of the Caribbean, it has been a uphill battle. <laughs> the Caribbean, um, of course, is it's unique in the sense of geography, but it's also very unique in terms of its um, a mix of languages, a mix of cultures, a mix of identities, and also a mix of social affordances, which is also something that has very manifest implications for people's ability to access information, let alone people's ability to take in information and to indigenize that. Um, I, 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 I say that because right now, again, you know, the sort of information ignorance that exists as it pertains to the issues that go on right now are not just because of, say, I don't know, some plot to sort of keep or lock out certain actors from the conversation, but it's also in many sense because the people that sit at the very lowest part of the um, stakeholder pyramid oftentimes aren't engaged. They aren't engaged because they don't know and because we know that they don't know we just do what makes sense and so it just happens and we just treat with the fallout when it happens and a way in which we can of course treat with that is through of course upping the stakes as it relates to information salience one of the chief most ways in which 
I didn't, of course, Sherry and other people in this call um, do is through, say, using Wikipedia. Um, what I'd actually like to do right now is, um, I do notice that we're coming up almost to time, but um, we want to have a small, you know, a mini um, sort of training session. But before that, I want to open up for comments um, with, with, with what you'd John, just described, Noah Gaspar. Um, if anyone on the floor wants to add to that, please, by all means. Um, there's a lot to pick from. And I mean, I, I totally want to follow up on a lot of the points that you mentioned, Gaspar, hopefully um, in the October session, but of course in um, sessions succeeding this. But please, um, anyone on the floor, if you have any comments, by all means, raise your hand or just unmute really quickly. I just wanted to touch a point if I may, um, from what you said, uh, I think there's also a bigger discussion to to have. And of course, I'm not a local, and it, and this happens to me when we are working on any country in the region. I feel like lately, the problem is not digital rights, but it's in general human rights. It's been... We are a very convulsed region. We constantly suffer about political and economical, um, let's say, instabilities. But there's like a clear disregard for human rights. It's like we already assume that we have these rights and, they, and that there is no need to fight for them. Or I always question, I always think about this. When did state security or public security became more important than privacy? Because privacy came up when people suffer the enormous um, control they got uh, from the state, from the state. So in that moment, privacy was really important to protect them from this invasion. Now, apparently the narrative is changing. Now, it's, today it's more important to be safe than to be private, but we don't understand that this, behind this argument of being safe is state control. So I think there is also a discussion about, maybe this is too meta, I don't know, but I honestly think, how do we get people to fight for the rights again. I think we, at some point, we'll, we, start, we start losing the battle uh, about people caring about their rights. I, I feel, in, in particularly in some countries, that people just gave up at some point. And I think that's a, a discussion. I think we need to have locally and regionally and even globally. Completely agree. Thanks. So that, please Thanks. jump on well, it. Oh yeah, Sherry. I think uh, for you go first if you wanted to talk. Nope, nope. I was just pointing you at Soledad. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I completely agree with Gaspar. There's a sense of of powerlessness, particularly when it comes to. I think that the issue of of, of digital privacy or privacy in the dig digital area concerns a lot of people. There are surveys uh, um, conducted in countries from around the world that. Privacy, privacy online, it is uh, an issue of concern, but there's this huge sense of powerlessness. And in that sense, of course, uh, formally adopting critical digital education is important. And also within those, within that education, showcasing the community-led initiatives that have brought change in terms of regulations, how, because we have the human rights, but then how do we exercise this? How do we hold accountable the various stakeholders in order to ensure that these rights are being um, are being promoted, um, and which are the new challenges that are that that each area has has brought, and that this one specifically is very very much particular. Um, so, getting more people interested and, and showing them how the different how there are different types to participating, as Sherry was saying, even populating Wikipedia with your own standpoint from the Afro community on what is the history, what is happening, what is going on, and, 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 and what the community is doing to bring that change that is uh, really important, and which are the successes, what, what has been done, 
uh, that's also important to to show um, to, to to give some agency or, or hope to people and to broaden this community as well and, and to campaign. Completely agree with that. I um yeah, it's 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 important that we, you know, really evaluate the entire sort of stakeholder pyramid. And I don't I keep using this phrase all the time, but you know, really going through the entire matrix and really engaging with as intimately as possible all the different points that we have to address. Of course, this is not a one-person issue, and this is not a one-person task by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, again thinking of where we are in the Caribbean and of course the fact that many people if you were to ask them on the street you were to do just a regular sort of poll just to ask someone hey what do you think of you know the fact that you know your data could be collected without your knowledge and it could be used against you you know for any particular reason you don't really know it's just there and they'll be pretty scared I don't think I don't think there's anyone you know that exists that would perhaps say, oh yeah, I'm totally okay with that. You know, it's 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 so, um, you know, it, it's a thing that I, I, I'm pretty open to. But, you know, again, it's this, it's this question of, again, like when Richard, and I'm, I'm trying to read the comments here as well. So if anyone has, if, if you want to jump in and, and verbalize your comment as well, please by all means. Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah, so again, you know, if, as it pertains to this discussion of, of rights here in the Caribbean, like, I mean, there's so much to be said, but I wanna give way to you, Peter, really quickly, if you could, um, just uh, verbalize what you'd mentioned in the chat and, and you know, and so we could have a, a quick round about that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just listening and, and you've all had this thought already, but uh, I was thinking I would hear about digital rights as a matter of law and, those topics came up, but a lot of it is about access. You said access was maybe under half of the population. And then that means infrastructure. And then the practices like of those big companies. Um, Wikipedians may be able to help um, indirectly. I mean, by documenting, by advocating some kind of law or, or, or uh, documenting what the standard law is or should be. Um, then um, I'm a Wikipedia person, so we are open to listening to advice. I wish we could run a network or at least a digital cafe, but it is not very realistic. And even if we did, it wouldn't help enough people. No, I mean, you're, you're right, Peter. I mean, look, the, 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 the Wikimedia community, for instance, is one of the best positioned communities in terms of how vast and how wide the community is. I mean, you could pool expertise from any number of people in any number of geographies. But then the question then becomes, for instance, like, you know, that local element, there's only so few of us who are really connected to that kind of ecosystem and can really help drive the synergy there. And then what then happens now is again, moving through that ladder that you just mentioned, the fact that you move from that then to the access. How many people are able to access that information? Um, how digestible is that information? How are they accessing that information? When are they accessing that information? So we could go into any you know, permutation, if you will. And then again, it brings, it raises the question again, like. Are stakeholders in the Caribbean even making information salient altogether? Do we care enough to make this information um, at the forefront, to make it paramount, to make it something that we treat with before we treat with everything else? You know, again, that could go into a broader conversation about super political culture, and I recognize uh, that space. But go ahead, Sherry. I also, just to piggyback on what you're saying and, and what Peter said, um, the the question of saliency and relevance as well as pathways to access um are all peripheral issues that i believe that we do have some um some well some equally peripheral uh influence on for example i mean if you have uh uh if if for example you have an event where you're having a wikipedia um training or some other related event um, you know, you need access to the technology. Well, one person by themselves can only do so much. But if you are connected with other people um, who 
uh, are trying to achieve the same, then you can share resources. Um, I'll just, you know, go with the example of a school, right? Um, when you have a, an event at a school, then it only not only benefits you, but it also benefits whoever comes to the same. And you're, yes, you're there for that purpose, but at the same time, it also um, is an opportunity to share resources for access, for understanding, for training, and also for knowledge of what else is being done um, in the area of digital access. That's just a, a random example, but I think when we put our minds together on what can be done to um, make the pathway clear, then um, there, there are more, more possibilities arise. And I think Aspar has something to say. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of you. Um, I think that the, the point that Peter raises is, is essential. Like, connectivity is the first right to all the other rights that come with internet. There is definitely many things that can be done, but there's so little some actors can do in that regard. Let me explain a little bit further. We see, and, and of course I'm talking without having the, the knowledge of, if, of each of the countries and, and, and in general in the region, but you see that you, we see a lot of, uh, of, of states investing in other technologies than internet. So the, you, you see, there's a question there. Like why, for example, do we need um, surveillance tech cameras? What do we need to deploy a digital ID program if we have under half of our population, sorry, more than half of our population without access? Like you are spending all that money in that technology. And I, and I mean, there are way too many answers for that. And those answers might change from country to country. But in order to make that change and get the state to invest in these, um, in these infrastructures, first you need to build knowledge about what those technologies are. Because for example, when it comes to digital ID, most of our governments buy that idea from the companies that are selling the, 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 whole, the whole system, like the biggest solution in order to provide services. And it's a huge lie. And because our states are not well informed is that they will spend all that money in those systems and not in, in on internet. So building knowledge, I think it's crucial for that. Also, there are a lot of organizations working in developing um, community networks community networks as, are a great tool in order to improve the connectivity issue. Um, there are even some countries that pass laws to promote different initiatives um, that teach people to create those community networks. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the, the, they are, it seems like everything we do is not enough. But it's, I think, in addition, uh, with all these efforts that we will reach a point where we have enough understanding, enough engagement in order to promote a safer and wider digital environment. Um, but yeah, I think that the point you made is uh, absolutely true. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, and, and again, you know, this is an iterative process. I mean, we're only just at the start of really what is becoming a much more broader, much more deeper engagement with the Caribbean as it pertains to digital human rights and just the work of, you know, building a local knowledge base, actually, um, and, 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 and really helping perfect the record there as it pertains to what's going on. And, Again, we're not just talking about this in, 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 um, in regard to, say, just the move on human rights and digital human rights, but everything altogether. There's still such a huge glaring lack 
of information, not just on Wikipedia, on Wikimedia Commons, on Wikidata, so many other projects. And again, none of these projects are, say, um, outside of the remit of the talent sure. that in the Caribbean, right? You know, none of these projects are things that are completely outside of the ball court, as it were. People within the Caribbean, we have people in the Caribbean who, you know, work in, you know, data and software engineering and all, you know, they touch on all parts of technology, but are not within the kind of knowledge ecosystem that would help in some sense to, for instance, perfect the record when we get into conversations about artificial intelligence. How will the Caribbean then engage with artificial intelligence if and when we don't have enough of a great corpus of literature and online information that these um, resources can pull from and have a good you know, ability to, to, to sort of reflect that in the best, most accurate way possible. Um, and I think that sort of like ties into again um, what we would get get into in the very last bit of the session here. Um, but I think we did we did touch on it very briefly about um, um, one such way in which we could treat with that, of course, that being uh, you know Wikipedia. We we're also talking about, for instance, um, you know Peter had actually mentioned of this something sort of like a cafe. One way in which we um, address this, of course, is through Editathons. Um, our second event or next event in October is actually going to be an editathon around about the same time, um, just later for about the same time period, um, focused on shares and at least building on some parts of the knowledge info um, ecosystem as it pertains to um, digital human rights. Um, I do also want to flag too that we have. Um, people here that have quite a bit of expertise in that, of course, Sherry has spoken about a lot of her experiences. She's done so much work across um, the Caribbean, but also Africa as well, all over the world and how, you know, we can move forward in, especially in underrepresented communities, much like the Caribbean, in helping perfect the record or make more, um, you know, uh, say representative, the, the kind of realities that are on the ground in these regions. Peter's also done a lot of work as well. Um, Peter, you've done um, quite a bit as it relates to, for instance, um, the um, record on um, Wikipedia as it relates to vaccinations, for instance, which is a very um, hot topic right now. <laughs> if I, I, I won't say exactly what's been going on there, but you know, again, it's it's it touches on the temporality of these issues. Oftentimes when we work on these issues and we work on um, these topics, they don't manifest, the kind of implications don't manifest at that moment. It oftentimes comes later on when you, I don't know, have a celebrity spewing misinformation about a particular topic. I won't say which one, but a topic nonetheless that makes you know headlines and people need ready information on this um, specific topic because we need to have you know a a, a foundation um, rooted in um, you know verifiability and objectivity and um, of course you know with that said I wanted to turn over really quickly to Sherry I, I think we have a little bit more. I think we have about 15 or so, roughly speaking, minutes. We could just get into, um, you know, a bit of um, what we do in terms of Wikipedia and how we sort of bridge that conversation. And then we will talk a bit more after that about what our next session would look like. So, um, Sherry, I, I don't know if you have, um, you, you have a few words that you want to um, touch on really quickly. Yeah. Yes. Um, so very briefly, um, so so this is, has been a tremendous conversation and I hope that we continue to discuss the different tones that we're including in it. Um, getting back to the focus on uh, the Wiki community and different ways of being involved in digital information, digital humanities and, uh, and so forth. Um, what an edit-a-thon is, which is which was mentioned earlier, um, well, we've all heard of a hackathon, right? And we've all heard of a marathon. An edit-a-thon is sort of a smushed idea of those two, but in the digital space. Um, 
uh, the Wikipedia specific uh, digital space. So during um, an edit-a-thon, we would normally in the olden days um, of in-person events meet for at least three hours to not only train everyone in how to edit Wikipedia um, from bottom up, but also um, work together to attack specific areas of, mis of, of missing information, for example, so information gaps. Um, We've in the uh, in 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 Wiki Caribbean, um, for example, we were we held one of our first events in Puerto Rico at Microsoft, and um, we worked with with participants. These are open to the public um, to learn how to edit, but also to um, add information about specifically the Caribbean, right? So for example, notable figures, places, items. Um, one person wrote about rum cake. I mean, you can write about anything, but the basic of it is that everyone is, um, uh, everyone uh, can participate um, and um, uh, we, we, will train anyone how to edit. And what we mean by that is not only how to add information, but also how to do it in a way that um, helps it to stay and last longer in the space. And also different items like um, I mentioned coding, some very basic coding um, for those who are interested in that or anyone who's interested in, in, for example, trying one of the other sister projects like Wikidata, which focuses on data points like um, person, uh, uh, the, the place, the thing, those kinds of specific items, data points. And also things like Wikimedia Commons where you can add images and audio, um, oral knowledge is now something that's um, being entered there that we've worked with. Or if you want to add information that's missing in another language. So we've mentioned Spanish, there's also Haitian Creole, there's also um, uh, uh, Papiamento, there's um, many different languages that are, um, that are uh, available on Wikipedia, but the information in those languages can be lacking because there aren't people editing them in those languages. Wikipedia finally can also be um, a place not to only document information, for example, what different programs or uh, uh, different groups um, have been talk, we've been talking about different groups and what's been happening with digital information in the Caribbean. Um, it can also be a place to add information, uh, for example, um, in uh, sources that you can cite, which are very important when you're talking about um, a digital encyclopedia. You need information that can be cited um, and used for adding that information. So something like Wikisource is great for that as well. And um, so in this process that we're gonna kind of walk through today, we'll learn the basics of that and also how it applies to the conversation that we just had. So hopefully it'll be useful, but um, we're gonna be also coming back in October to do even more. So this won't be your last chance. Absolutely. So. What I will do, um, I think what we could do um, very quickly is I will, I think I should uh, go ahead and just share my screen really quickly. And then Sherry, you would just uh, narrate me through, uh, let me just uh, put this down. Hopefully I'll see you because it's been coming in and out throughout. Right, let, me, let me see if I can, um, you all should be able to see my yes. screen. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so, as you can see, so now I'm, I'm on the homepage, this is the Wikipedia homepage. I think we're all very, very painfully aware of this or late night searches about, yeah, I don't know, anything, you find yourself here at some point. Um, so of course, this is just how we get into, you know, finding any random bit of information. But then there's a whole nother world that exists on the other side. If I could, for instance, let us, I don't know, let's go to the um, page on the Dominican Republic, if I can spell today. There we go. And here we are. Now, of course, we all know what this looks like. And there might be a bit of extra flourishes on my version. Um, again, these are all things as you sort of go through, 
the whole process of being a comedian, you sort of add different, um, you know, um, bells and whistles to your account, and then you sort of, you know, make um, make the account what you'd like it to. But if you notice, and you all have probably hit it either advertently or inadvertently, um, you've probably hit, for instance, the edit button. And if I could hit the edit button, of course, you'd come up. And this in and of itself is a, a more accessible form of editing. Um, you touch in and you should be able to, if it would pop up, hopefully. Um, right. So right here, you have here, again, the editable version of the page on the Dominican Republic. Now, I don't advise anyone who's just starting out to, on Wikipedia to go on and edit a page on the Dominican Republic. You perhaps want to start with something a bit less high stakes. But again, you know, you get a sense of the fact that this is, again, an open record. But open record insofar as it allows you to help to contribute with verifiable and objective fact um, as it pertains to a particular subject matter. Right here, for instance, we're looking at the page and as you can see, it's very well supplied. This is one of the better, if not one of the best um, uh, coverage um, of any particular Caribbean country, um, this rendition um, of the Dominican Republic. But if you notice too at the side, as I scroll right here, let me see if I can get my uh, annotation here with my mouse. If you see here at the side, you can see all these various languages that aren't just languages that you know Wikipedia is available in, but these are actually languages that the page is available in. So let's say, for instance, I want to have a look at it in Catalan. And here we are. We're looking at the page for Wikipedia in Catalan. I mean, the page for um, the Dominican Republic on Wikipedia in Catalan. And I could go back here. And again, we're looking at the page now in English. There also, I think we have a Papiamento version. It will take me some time to find that. But again, this is just like, again, showing you the fact that there is a whole other side um, of Wikipedia that exists. One thing that I do want to mention forever, um, for instance, is that of um, the process of, say, reviewing what's been going on. You want to see the history of the page. You want to see what's been going on, the development. Oftentimes, you see a wealth of information on the um, super context, if you will, um, of the conversation on the talk history page, the talk page rather, or on the view history. I'll go and hit the talk. And here you can have a look to see what's been going on on the page. You can see a whole host of information that for instance, you probably didn't even really care to know, but looking at it, you're like, oh my goodness, like this is so interesting. Like for instance, the fact that this page was actually featured on Wikipedia's main page on the on this day on 10 dates. And you can see the dates that it was featured on the page, on the main page of Wikipedia. You can see the various projects that it's affiliated with. You could even go down and see, for instance, like different people talking about what they would like to see happen. And this talk section is where a lot of the finer details are discussed and ventilated on Wikipedia. And then I just wanna to touch on really quickly what happens with the actual revisions of the page. So as you can see here, this page is in, I mean, constant flow. It's constantly being changed. There's constant movement happening. And the page of course is of course, very well trafficked. And so you would very obviously have that added attention. One thing that I would like to do is say, okay, I would like to, I don't know, go and make an edit. I'm, let's try and let's see if I could go and make an edit. So I'm just gonna go back to read. And um, let's see, I'm gonna go back to article actually. And I'm gonna go here to edit. So you could go and hit edit source if you're that sort of intrepid person who'd like to really dig deep into code. I wouldn't advise, but if it's something you'd like to do, by all means. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would advise because it gets- I was cool. inducting code, so that's my, my issue. <laughs> <laughs> 
So again, as the as the 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 um, the prompt comes up, um, as you can see here, you're really allowed to really dig deep into um, the page and see what's going on. So for the purposes of this um, session, what I will do is I would actually go here and I'm going to add an image. I think that's one of the simplest ways that you could go forward in actually adding something to the record on Wikipedia. It helps to illustrate many things, in fact, because a picture is worth a thousand words, isn't it? So I head here to insert. Sorry, I moved a bit too fast here. So I go to insert, and then I hit images and media. And then we come up here and you could see, for instance, some of my recent uploads. So if you wanna see my activity on Wikimedia Commons, there it is. But this platform actually pulls from Wikimedia Commons, which is a sister project of Wikipedia, which is again, one of the reasons why we stress a lot of the time, equally engaging in the same breath that we do Wikipedia with Wikimedia Commons. I go here and I type in Dominican Republic, And then you see a number of things pop up. You see the flag, you see the embassy, you see a diplomat, you see so many different things. You see a view of Santiago de los Caballeros, for instance. Um, oh, you see, beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, you have uh, so many different things to look at and see and to publish. So for instance, let's say I'm gonna add this picture of the beach with Punta Cana. Seems quite tranquil or La Playita or this bridge in Santiago in um, the Dominican Republic. In fact, let's go with the picture of the bridge. And I'm gonna hit use this image and I could say um, photo capturing um, a bridge in Santiago, Dominican Republic. And then I hit insert. And right then, I could actually then move forward with say, moving the image to where I would like it to go. So for the purposes, of course, I, for first of all, I wouldn't add the image here, but if and when, for instance, I want to move the image, let's say I'm just gonna scroll down. Uh, let's find a place that I could say, place it. Uh, let's see. In history, and we go down. And you know what? This is also a great hint, too. It's also great to figure out where you'd like to place the image beforehand. Um, uh, you can also use the, the find feature, which is the same on any computer. So control F right. and look for, look for names associated with what you're placing. Right. So let's say, for instance, you found if my, uh, what's going on here right so okay let's say for argument's sake you finished and you found your perfect location and do you want to place that image down and this is the final location of that image what do you do very simple you hit publish change and then what you do you come up with this nice simple prompt that says what did you do give us a summary of your edit and say image of bridge and Santiago edit. You wanna say it's a minor edit? You wanna watch the page? Sure. You can either review your changes or you could just go and hit publish changes. And once you hit this button right here in blue, you're all set. It's on the public record and there you are. You've made your first consequential edit to Wikipedia. <laughs> so for the purposes of this particular um, uh, tutorial, we're not going to publish this change. However, I would encourage if it is that you find something, anything, you know, you've created an account, which is something that we will go through, uh, perhaps in the, we could, uh, we could do a small tutorial, but I think for, we could do that in the October session. But um, once you have an account and you're up and set, you could just get started with a small and edit. If it's a full stop, it doesn't matter. It's important, it's consequential, it's relevant. And you start from there 
and building the corpus of your work on Wikipedia. I myself started out with just adding a sentence. And next thing I knew, here I am. So again, these things really, of course, they start very small, but they build into a large body of work that helps to inform the public record on so many different issues that are contextual and relevant to our current reality. So can I mention I will... something, Brandon? Sure thing, go ahead. So um, something that, um, and, and this is brief, something that's uh, akin to this that might help your point is um, when you're planting um, a garden, right? Um, you first start with a seed and the seed will either stay in the ground and die for lack of attention or sunlight, or you can give it sunlight, make sure it's watered. Um, and it doesn't have to be the same, uh, you know, the same day. Um, but as long as it gets some attention, um, another person could come and water it. Another person can add some more seeds. Um, and, and eventually what you have is a garden. And if it's a, uh, if it's a tree, for example, that you've planted, eventually you'll have a large tree with many branches. And, um, and then you look back and you say, oh my gosh, look at, look at the thing that I helped start it and look at how beautiful it is. So think about what you're doing as an individual person that's, uh, you know, planting that seed of information as adding to or, or watering um, something that's already there, for example, an article like this one that already has information but could have add more added to it, as you kind of continuing to water that garden, giving it uh, sunlight, which is um, <laughs> the sunlight of, of, of new information, for example, and uh, to continue to grow that um, garden of information, that tree of knowledge, uh, so to speak. And so it's a continual process that many people can participate in. But at the end of the day, it becomes this beautiful, uh, you have this beautiful result. And in some cases, you have to prune certain areas, right? And that's our misinformation. So if you have if you spy something that isn't correct or doesn't have any kind of uh, root, <laughs> for example, in, re in a citation, for example, then you can either add that citation, that, that source that, that, um, that links it up to the real world, or you can help to prune it by, um, you know, uh, adding correct information when you see misinformation. So just to think of it in, in that other way uh, as to how this um, becomes what it is and what you see before you. Absolutely. Tree of knowledge, yeah. forest of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's again, you know, it really is again, a exercise in practically gardening. You're gardening information, you're tailoring and you're really you know, trying to create, you know, a beautiful, bountiful bed of information that people can willingly access and make their own. Um, and again, that bears fruit. <laughs> that bears fruit. The, hopefully, the fruit of the informed citizen. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to stop my share. And then I think with that, we pretty much are coming up to the end of our discussion here. So with that being said, I will open the floor to any closing comments anyone has. Um, but before I do that, I just wanna say again that this was an absolutely amazing discussion. I really loved the just profundity of um, you know experiences and also shares here. I mean, I put on my international relations cap, I put on my advocate cap, I put on my Wikimedian cap, I put on so many caps at this point, like I'm wearing all of them. <laughs> and you know, I really was able to, um, and I'm sure everyone else in the room feels the same really get a sense of all the different points of perspectives that we have to really treat with if we are truly willing to you know really activate and move forward in the work that needs to be done in the Caribbean. Um, I leave the floor open to anyone else who wants to um, leave any closing comments as well. Um, by all means please just unmute and you know I'm sure your thoughts as well. I'm gonna to touch on the side <laughs> conversation we're having on the yes. on the chat. Peter, I was asking if while you were doing that editathon, um, 
if the issue of um, COVID um, and, and vaccine passports emerged in, in, in terms of, of the information that was being included? I don't think so. It's possible to look back at what we edited, but I don't remember discussing it. Great. And um, thank you everyone for the, the opportunity. I, I'm here trying to also enable, my idea mostly is to enable the participation of people that are locally from the Caribbean and particularly youth organizations. So uh, please help us spread the word and, um, and convene more organizations and youth organizations if, if you think um, that could be able to participate. The idea is to show and to talk about digital or human rights online or, or human rights in the digital era, not just constrained into law or people need, or, or lawyers or people that are that are studying this or technologists, trying to break down what these are, the importance of having an open discussion um, and, and to co-create co the, the, the solutions. That's that's the idea. And one one solution is um, providing the um, gardening the, the our garden of, of information through through Wikipedia. So I'm very much looking forward for next session and to seeing you next time. And please help us spread the, the, the word with, with these activities. Well, Soledad, I just want to open an invitation to you and uh, your colleagues. Um, and I, I believe Brendan would uh, agree. We have a, an event happening next week um, focused on the Caribbean. And it's not only celebrating the Caribbean, but we're inviting um, folks to come talk about issues that are relevant to the Caribbean um, or work that they're doing. And it would be lovely for you to pass through. Um, so you're welcome and your colleagues are welcome um, uh, if you'd like to join us. It would be great. Yeah. Thank so you. That's, uh, that's Sunday, Sunday uh, for, at 2.30. Uh, this Sunday? Know, yeah, the, no, I think it's the 26th. It's the 26th, yeah, yeah next Sunday. Lovely. Sorry. Yeah, great. Perfect. Wiki, Wiki carries it. I'll put it in the, the chat. From my side, um, I don't want to take much more of your time. Just really grateful for all this information. Um, for me, it's really amazing like to be able to edit Wikipedia, which we already know we were able to, but like to feel like more, more close to us, like, hey, just go to this to this place in the page. And for me, that is going to be amazing. So thanks, Sherry and Brandon, especially for all your knowledge and expertise on this on these matters. And yeah, looking forward for our next session. Um, trying to convene more, more people because I'm not in the Caribbean. I'm not the one that should be editing those pages. So we will be looking for other other participants to be in there. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, I'm also putting the link to the festival uh, in the chat if anyone is interested in that as well. And hopefully that could offer uh, an opportunity to continue the conversation some more. Absolutely. Yeah, Peter, do you want to go ahead? I'm just copying the link. OK, so from my side, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, Great to meet you, working, that's fine. Thanks. Uh, personally, I think, and, and I think something we share with Angela, it's uh, a desire we have to work more in the Caribbean and to get people to pay more attention to, to what's going on in the region. I think we are trying to do it both locally on, on, on an international level. Um, there are challenges for sure, but we need to overcome, overcome them and keep moving forwards because uh, this, is, this is really important. <laughs> Completely agree, Gaspar. And you know, at least from my side, I remain committed to the idea of really moving forward with, you know, all the work that we. <laughs> I saw your comment, Peter. Yes, you can wear bright colors if you want to. You can wear anything you'd like. I mean, the Caribbean is a, you know, melting pot of so many different, um, you know, shares perspectives. I mean, I'm from the Caribbean, and I like black and white and I mean, cultures. Cultures, you know. I'm not the most multi, you know, um, multicolored person, variegated, but I mean, hey, I mean, hey, look, 
you know, yeah, I, 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 I remain committed to the idea of really moving forward in the work that has to be done as it pertains to- um, The photograph has a carnival costume, that's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, you know, again, you know, it was just such a fantastic share that we had here today. And of course, as we yes. move forward, uh, the, the thank you, Access Now. Yeah. And thank you, of course, Access Now, Jack Black, you know, and Peter, of course, Wikimedians of the Caribbean, you know, and also Wiki Conference North America, which we'll also be engaging with in our next um, event in October as well. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, for being part of this, and I am I'm, I'm so excited to see what happens in October. And thank and you, Brandon, for all of your hard work. <laughs> thank you. As well thank as the you. committee and everybody involved. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, look, this pet, you know, as as you call it, solely that the petite committee. It, I mean, we, it, you, we, we move mountains, and I'm so thankful. I'm so happy, you know, to to have been able to work with you all and to continue in working with you all. And thanks to all the stakeholders involved, and on to the next step. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. I think it was Angela's uh, idea of the petite committee it was awesome and uh yeah and looking forward to have to how to make these spaces more more inclusive all, all ideas are more than, than welcome as well and thank you for the invitation have a lovely day rest of the day night you too bye, folks. Take care. Bye, bye see you next time bye bye, bye, -bye.